Thank you uh, so much um, for the uh, invitation to be here uh, this morning. Let's see. How do I advance the slides like that? Perfect. Um, I have no disclosures. Uh, that was a great introduction, and um, what my what my part of uh, today's session is is really talking about the influence of how the intestinal bacteria may influence um, uh, anastomotic healing. Really, giving all of us an out and blaming someone else besides ourselves. Um, it should not be surprising that the intestinal organisms somehow interact with intestinal tissue. Um, there's 100 trillion intestinal organisms. There's 10 times more microbial cells than there are human cells. And we really think about the microbiome interacting with the host in a very symbiotic relationship. We need the bugs as much as the bugs need us. And although it's been very exciting over the last five or 10 years looking deeply into this, it's really been known for more, way longer than that, that intestinal bacteria cause an asthmatic leak. This study done in 1955 by Dr. Isidore Cohen, he took dogs, gave them an anastomosis, and then devascularized that segment right adjacent to the anastomosis. He then put a catheter in on the devascularized segment and infused either tetracycline or saline. Not surprisingly, the animals that got um, ischemia, they looked awful. You would never close this patient if this was one of yours. Um, and not surprisingly, they, um, on post-up day seven, they leaked and developed peritonitis and died in those that got saline. Surprisingly, though, those that got tetracycline were completely protected from an asthmatic leak, and none of these animals developed peritonitis. In a similar study done about 30 years later, they looked at the tensile strength, or how strong that anastomosis is as it's being exposed to increasing doses of antibiotics. The y-axis is the, is the tensile strength, and as you can see, is this not working? Oh, there we go. And as you can see, as antibiotics, as the doses of antibiotics go up, the tensile strength significantly goes up as well. And what we conclude from both of these studies, this is a little finicky. Is there a clicker? Perfect. As we conclude from both of these studies, is that bacteria has some type of major influence in an asthmatic killing. We just didn't really know how till recently. We've been investigating a hypothesis that is generally pretty simple. We have normal flora. The host undergoes some type of host stress, either ischemia, radiation, malnutrition, um, obesity. There's a change in the microbiome. This allows proliferation of other rare organisms, sort of like weeds growing in, a, in the grass. This then allows those organisms to, the ones that, uh, that proliferate to develop a phenotype of bacterial collagenase, and this binds to an anastomosis causing it to heal. The first question though that, we, that I wanna bring up is, is the microbiome, this is going funny, that's all right. Um, is the mic, what does the microbiome look like at the time of surgery? Before we do an anastomosis, what are our patients showing up as? This is in essence, what does the heart look like if you're doing an echocardiogram? In these experiments, sorry about that, it's a little funky. Um, in these experiments, each one of these bars is a, is a human, and we're looking at the time of surgery and what the microbiome community structure looks like um, on right before we do any intervention. Each color represents the proportion of a, of a certain phylum. Um, again, each bar is a certain human patient. The blue represents bacteroides. These are the healthy bacteria, which is normally present at an abundance of about 60%. And you can see in these patients, again, we haven't done anything to them. They're just obese, they smoke, they have radiation. Their um, proportion of bacteroides is extremely small. I, I, uh, alternatively, firmicutes, which is some good and some bad bacteria, represented by the orange, which is normally about in a proportion of 25%. In some patients, this has completely overtaken uh, their community structure. And we conclude, conclude, what we conclude from this is that the preoperative microbiome in patients undergoing colorectal surgery, especially in some patients, is completely abnormal. Now, what about right at the site of the anastomotic tissue? Well, in these experiments, we did these in, in mice and rats, and we looked at the community structure at the time of surgery and compared it to post-up day six. This is a principal component analysis plot. Each dot represents a bacterial community structure. When they're close to each other, they're similar. When they're further away, they're different. And looking at the stool, you can see there isn't much difference between the community on post-up day six and post-up day zero. But when you look at the anastomosis, 
the community on post-op day zero is dramatically different from the community that's actually stuck onto that anastomotic tissue. We wanted to figure out what was actually driving that, and what we found is similar to the initial a data that I showed um, is that there is an increase of this kind of bad bacteria, what, what we called enterococcus. And this is just a histological uh, uh, example of that, that you have the anastomotic tissue, and in purple is enterococcus binding to that. And what this analysis shows is that surgery alone causes a 90% reduction in bacteroides, that good stuff, and a 500% 500-fold uh, 500 bloom in enterococcus. What we've done over the last couple of years is we've developed a bunch of different models to look at this, and they all sort of do the same thing. We give a mouse or a rat an anastomosis, and then we exhibit it to some type of host stress. The stresses that we've been using is ischemia, um, which we'll learn how important that is uh, in the coming sessions, a high-fat diet, we know obese patients are at risk, um, opioids as well. And what we found in all of these is that under the right conditions, there's proliferation of different collagenase organisms, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, Serratia, or Proteus, that when they have developed a collagenase phenotype, they can bind to an anastomosis in animals and cause it to degrade. Now, Enterococcus is interesting because when you look at the literature, it's the most commonly isolated organism from leaking patients, not just patients undergoing colorectal resections, but also patients undergoing uh, Whipple resections or upper GI stuff. Um, so it's very, it's, it's, it's very appealing as a target organism. What do we do from here? Um, we have, the, our work has probably developed more questions than answers, um, but I think probably most of us in the field now agree that oral antibiotic bowel prep, uh, along with mechanical bowel prep, does uh, significantly reduce the incidence of anastomotic leak. Um, in these two studies from a couple years ago, and of course others have been repeated, um, this uh, does reduce leak. Again, this is from annals in 2015, um, showing that oral antibiotics does re reduce the uh, leak rate significantly. But again, there's still some patients that leak. And even though it's only you know 2.5% in this group, um, for those patients, as uh, it was pointed out, and for the surgeons, uh, it sucks. Um, so we're looking a little bit into how does the bowel prep individualize patients' risk of leak. And this is a very simple study where we looked at the collagenolytic potential in patients before bowel prep and after bowel prep, and probably not to our surprise or to your surprise, is significantly decreased um, after prep, the amount of collagenolytic organisms that were in the stool. Now, within this group, though, again, you can see it didn't wipe it out. There were some patients that still had collagen-like organisms that were present. And this study, again, from human patients at the time of surgery, shows that in some of these patients, they still had colonization of high collagenolytic pseudomonas and enterococcus. And this study wasn't powered uh, to detect leak, but I will tell you that the patient who had enterococcus here did um, develop an asthmatic leak. And what we, what we conclude from this is collagen or organisms still persist in selected patients after our standard prep. Now, in, in, the last, in the last minute or so, I just wanted to share some kind of exciting data. Um, you know, giving antibiotics, we've been doing it for a long time, and it works, but it doesn't work perfectly. And rather than carpet bombing the entire microbiome, we're trying to develop ways in which we can maybe alter it uh, to help us um, rather than let it hurt us. So in these experiments, we've developed... We've taken mice and serially sacrificed them on certain days after surgery. Um, and we've compared a normal diet to, to mice who undergo a low-fat fiber, high-fat diet, again, one of these host stress that has allowed proliferation of these organisms that cause leak. And all the data I've shown you, again, is either at the time of leak or on the day of surgery. But what is actually happening to the microbiome during the development of leaks during that kind of probably critical period of post-up day three to five? These, again, are microbiome graphs, and each, each, each bar um, represents a single uh, sacrifice day. And you can see in the chow fed, or this is the normal fed, enterococcus is in purple there. There is a little bit of a blossom of enterococcus during that kind of post-up day three to five period. 
in the high fat fiber diet, there's a huge blossom that is also persistent during those couple of days. And, and it, makes us, it makes us wonder, um, and again, this is just a, a different representation of that. It makes us wonder, are we giving the bowel prep at the right time? And preventing this early bloom in patients, in human patients may prevent an asthmatic leak. So in conclusion, just as a, um, as a summary, organisms respond to the environment, particularly by a host stress. Collagenase producing organisms likely play a major role in asthmatic leak. Mechanical and oral antibiotic prep reduces these organisms, but not completely. And this is our group, um, just some people that are responsible for the work. Of course, I work directly with Dr. Alverdi. Dr. Hyman pays for everything. Um, and uh, just to thank our, uh, our grant support from the uh, SSAT, ITM, and the NIH, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you.